Before starting uh, on the board, there are some info for people that sign up for the dinner. I just write down the latest bus you can take, but indeed you can go anytime you like. So that's the latest bus, and this stop is just in front of the road here. And here there are some instructions. It should be pretty simple. You can either take two buses or just one bus to go to the center, essentially, and then you walk there. And the dinner is at 8 p.m. Okay, so let's start uh, with uh, Upamanu Moitra. We we'll talk about the finite entanglement entropy in string theory. Please. Am I audible? Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to uh, give this talk here. Uh, I'm uh, really honored that I'm uh, giving the talk in this hallowed hall in front of uh, such a distinguished audience. And uh, this occasion is all the more special because uh, uh, I have uh, my teachers, including my advisor in the audience, as well as uh, some, of the, uh, some of my students uh, from the ICTP diploma course. And uh, I especially encourage the younger people uh, to uh, ask uh, questions uh, during the talk. Uh, it's really important. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, probably. Uh, uh, it should come back. Uh, I uh, would uh, encourage them to ask as many questions as they can because uh, I really want to uh, make it understandable to uh, everyone. So I'll be talking about finite entanglement entropy in string theory. And uh, just to emphasize the title, I will parse it backwards. So it's really string theory or super string theory that I'll be talking about in its full glory, and uh, it's the entanglement entropy, uh, which uh, I'll uh, explore. Uh, actually, not uh, even the entanglement entropy, uh, but as I'll argue, uh, something uh, that has more information than entanglement entropy itself. And the crucial part of the title is, of course, the first word, it's finiteness. So this work was uh, done in collaboration with my wonderful uh, collaborators seated over there. It has uh, really been an uh, amazing experience for me to work alongside him and to learn from him. Uh, and uh, as I'll explain, uh, the key idea he had developed about three decades back uh, on which uh, we built this work. So this is a paper that uh, appeared on the archive uh, last week. And uh, I'll also discuss briefly some unpublished results. So uh, let me start with the basics of entanglement. Entanglement is, of course, uh, a quintessentially quantum phenomenon. And it lies at the heart of quantum mechanics. Uh, spoken simply, uh, it qualifies the failure uh, to factorize a pure state uh, for a generic bi bipartite system into uh, states uh, into, uh, of its constituents. Uh, the simplest example uh, is, of course, the uh, maximally entangled uh, Bell state, uh, which uh, in this picture corresponds to uh, you know, just two spin half particles given as to a spin uh, zero state, uh, which we uh, cannot really factorize. Uh, for a bipartite system uh, whose Hilbert space can be uh, factored into two parts, in the HA tensor HB, uh, there's an easy way to define a, a density matrix, uh, which obviously the uh, pure state density matrix is uh, psi k, psi bra, and we do the partial traits over uh, the B Hilbert space to obtain a reduced density matrix, rho A. And this entanglement entropy is nothing but the von Neumann entropy uh, of this reduced density matrix, rho A, which is a quantifier of the entanglement present in such a pure state. And uh, in Entangle, uh, entanglement and its discussions, uh, the density matrix uh, is of utmost importance. And so here, uh, I'll quickly re uh, review uh, some nice aspects of density matrix, uh, which might be obvious to many, but uh, which is nonetheless important to emphasize. 
So in order to calculate the von Neumann entropy corresponding to some density matrix rho, we usually define something called uh, this quantity z hat, uh, which is a trace of rho to the script 10. And uh, please uh, you know, notice the distinction between script 10 and uh, something called n that we'll discuss later, because uh, that's going to be important uh, in what I say. Uh, for uh, typical systems, uh, we have uh, information only about some positive integral script n. And it's using this information we would uh, like to find an analytic extension of z hat in this variable script n. And this point was uh, very nicely emphasized in the introductory section of a paper uh, that Edward had uh, written in uh, 2018. Uh, the density matrix rho uh, is, of course, a Hermitian and positive semi-definite. And it has, of course, unit trace. So uh, if we uh, want to make an analytic extension on the complex plane uh, of uh, script n, this z hat n is bounded on the right half plane where real part of script n is greater than or equal to 1. And this is really an uh, important input that uh, as we uh, take more and more powers of rho and we take the trace, uh, it has to be very nicely behaved uh, on this uh, right half plane. In fact, uh, as real script n goes to infinity, this z hat should go to zero because of uh, these aforementioned properties. Uh, that said, the behavior on the entire complex script n plane may not be so nice. In particular, uh, to the left half plane, to the left of real n equals 1, uh, it can have uh, possibly sick behavior, uh, the sort of which uh, we'll encounter in due course. Uh, the von Neumann entropy is simply given by a derivative of uh, this analytic function at the value. Uh, script n equals 1. But uh, this script n equals 1, uh, you know, and, and its derivative is just, you know, one number. And uh, that doesn't contain uh, as much information as we would like. So we would like to know more. We would like uh, the behavior of uh, this quantity uh, as, a, uh, as an analytic function in script n. Uh, so, from quantum mechanics, uh, it's just a quick, uh, or actually not so quick, jump to uh, quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, we can uh, roughly imagine that there are degrees of freedom associated with each point in space. Uh, put this way, uh, we can think of trying to partition space into two halves. For example, we can try to think of partitioning this room into two halves and calculating the entanglement entropy between the degrees of freedom between these two halves. Uh, however, uh, as uh, we also learned from Edward this morning, strictly speaking, uh, such an operation is not valid in continuum quantum field theory. Uh, because the Hilbert space itself doesn't factorize in uh, continuum quantum field theory. And uh, more than that, it cannot be even written as a, a direct sum over direct products of Hilbert spaces associated with these two parts. Uh, however, uh, we are physicists, and we would like to calculate uh, something. Uh, and even this naive physical picture, uh, this can be given uh, you know, uh, some uh, nice meaning. Uh, with sophisticated machinery. Uh, this uh, sophisticated machinery goes by the name of uh, Tomita Takesaki theory, uh, which was nicely summarized by Edward in his uh, 2018 uh, APS medals RMP article. And uh, again, as we heard this morning, uh, there's a universal divergence in the entanglement entropy on account of short distance correlations across the entangling surface. Why is it universal? It's universal because it doesn't depend on the specific state being considered. It's uh, just a property of the algebra of observables. And the algebraic point of view in question was, uh, is quite useful in describing entanglement in uh, QFT. For example, uh, in quantum field theory, the algebra of observables in a region corresponds to 
uh, uh, type 3 von Neumann algebra, which is the worst kind as we already uh, heard today. But uh, obviously, uh, in quantum field theory, we still proceed, and uh, uh, there uh, is a host of, uh, actually not a host, there are a few methods available uh, by which we can calculate entanglement entropy, uh, or uh, some analogous quantity. Uh, foremost among uh, these is uh, replica method, uh, in which uh, to uh, calculate, uh, you know, trace rho to the n or some analogous quantities, uh, we simply uh, you know, take an n-fold cover of uh, the space, uh, spatial, uh, space-time manifold and just uh, glue it uh, together along the uh, you know, entangled surface. And in the process, we uh, introduce a branch cut with a branch point on the entangling surface. Uh, so this is a nice formal manipulation. Uh, and uh, it does give uh, very sensible answers. Uh, in particular, uh, for example, uh, the replica method is a key ingredient uh, in the proof of uh, the celebrated holographic entanglement uh, entropy formula by uh, Levkovich and Maldasena, which appeared roughly 10 years ago. But uh, so far we have been discussing QFT. Uh, there's obviously uh, one force uh, which we all know about. It's just this force, namely when we drop something it falls, the force of gravity. Uh, again, uh, we heard this morning uh, that uh, the situation improves considerably uh, when one includes gravity in the picture. And it was uh, shown by uh, Edward and several other collaborators, uh, as we heard, that uh, sometimes uh, the type 3 algebra actually gets uh, elevated or promoted to a type 2 algebra in the presence of gravity. And uh, in this context, I would also like to mention the work of my friend Sam, uh, who uh, identified a, a type 3 algebra in uh, Super Young Mills uh, pretty recently, and uh, which also is an important part of the story. Uh, heuristic arguments, uh, you know, of the sort uh, that were mentioned also uh, during this morning's talk, uh, they have indicated that the divergence uh, of uh, entanglement entropy, this can be, uh, you know, absorbed into the Newton constant, and uh, which roughly suggests uh, that the total entropy should be finite. And this is uh, uh, what was uh, sort of the driving, uh, the main point uh, made by uh, Suskind and Uglum in early 90s, and also uh, by Kabat and several other people uh, subsequently. However, uh, there's a key problem, which is that uh, we do not yet know how to rigorously define an algebra of observables in quantum gravity, or uh, that they would even make sense in a theory of quantum gravity. However, uh, this question, uh, I hope uh, all of us will agree, uh, is an incredibly important question. And we should be able to find at least an operationally meaningful way to uh, deal with entanglement in a quantum theory of gravity. I mean, this world, we know that uh, gravity exists, we know quantum mechanics exists, and there's quantum entanglement, so uh, we shouldn't you know, just throw up our hands and say that, okay, uh, we should be able to calculate something. And uh, as far as quantum gravity is concerned, we should be uh, looking at perhaps the theory of quantum gravity, and uh, to my knowledge, there's only one. String theory. However, even in string theory, uh, this is a serious problem, because we don't even know how to uh, formulate an algebra of observables in string theory. Then there's the next part of the problem, uh, that uh, strings are necessarily extended objects, and whenever we introduce some sharp boundary in a theory with extended objects, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not clear you know, whether we can even do that. And uh, this is also related to uh, the very soft UV behavior of string theory. And uh, 
Again, yesterday from Edwards' colloquium, we learned that uh, in theoretical physics, the uh, quite counterintuitively, the more the restrictions, the better the theory is. And string theory is the most restrictive of them all. And uh, the structure of string theory is so rigid uh, that you know, things we take for granted in QFT often fail to work in string theory. And there are many such examples. For the case at hand, though, uh, such an example uh, is the following, that in string theory, uh, we do not know of a string background uh, in which uh, it, you know, it corresponds to some uh, infold uh, cover of, uh, uh, which is branched at the entangling uh, surface. In string theory, uh, we always, uh, you know, uh, the most well understood aspects of string theory are of course on shell. So uh, we must at least start from some background which is a consistent background in string theory, otherwise uh, it would not make any sense. So that's another uh, serious problem. Therefore, what do we do? Okay, any questions at this point? If not, uh, let me proceed. So uh, the answer uh, was actually uh, given by my wonderful collaborator about 29 years back. It's uh, the, no, actually I am <laughs> serious and it's a remarkably prescient paper and in my personal opinion, this paper uh, is at least two decades ahead of its time and uh, it's no wonder that you know, we are only realizing it's important uh, relatively recently. So this appropriate method considers propagations of strings on a Zn or B fold where for a certain technical reason n is an uh, obviously positive and n is also an odd integer. So in replica trick, obviously we uh, multiply it, uh, we uh, put many things together, so there's a conical excess. And uh, in this case, there's a conical deficit. This doesn't work really. This, quite amazingly, describes an exact string background. Uh, there are tachyons, uh, but these tachyons, they don't, do not propagate in the bulk uh, really, and these are localized at the tip of the cone. Nevertheless, uh, I'll argue and uh, we'll see that in spite of being tethered to the tip of the cone, these tachyons are quite dangerous, so we shouldn't ignore them. Uh, we'll be considering uh, type two string theory in 10 dimensions. Uh, the spectrum obviously includes uh, closed strings uh, with massless uh, spin two excitations. In the early days of string theory, uh, this massless spin two uh, particle, you know, it was regarded as a nuisance until it was uh, recognized that it is really uh, the force of nature that was known to us, uh, you know, since the dawn of time. So gravity is an inseparable part of the story. So what is our goal? We want to calculate the contribution of the one loop partition function to the quantum entanglement entropy using the orbifold method. And uh, although I do not uh, go into the details right now, uh, because I mentioned one loop, you might be wondering about the classical piece. Uh, in, uh, it, as it was shown by Atish again about um, more than 20 years back, uh, this uh, classical piece actually gives uh, uh, the uh, bekenstein hawking term, uh, uh, you know, it, it just comes uh, in a very natural way from the string partition function. Sorry, yes. It's expected to give us the entanglement entropy of the half plane, right? Yes. Okay, so j just to make a couple of comments, in this situation, uh, you know, you could probably define entanglement entropy in gravity even in other situations, mm -hmm. but in this situation, the, we don't expect even in the theory of gravity that there would be any problem in defining entropy, right? Because we can always think of dressing operators to the side of the half plane, which includes asymptotic infinity. So, I'm not saying, any, yeah. so I'm just saying, so it's a, it's no, a good uh, but case you know, to it's, consider. Uh, it's, in the presence of dynamical gravity, I think even you know defining areas, surfaces might be an issue. So 
you might say that, okay, we are starting with the simplest possible non-trivial scenario which makes sense in a quantum theory of gravity. So, yeah. The scenarios also might make sense. But in ADS, yeah. for instance, we consider these kinds of regions all the time. Any sub-region yeah, 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 where you consider do. the RT surface yeah. goes off to infinity and there's no problem. Yeah, but uh, the I think uh, just calculating this quantity in a theory of gravity uh, is a subtle question. Uh, yeah, okay. Of Probably course, we, are, we are absolutely in agreement. Yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> okay. yeah. So, thank you. Thanks for that comment. So, uh, here's a uh, brief geometric picture of the model. Uh, this cone uh, is sort of the cone on which the strings propagate, and uh, there's a, a delta function type curvature singularity uh, at the tip of the cone, which really uh, doesn't matter. Uh, there are uh, closed strings uh, propagating in the bulk, and then there are closed strings uh, which are localized at the tip of the cone, uh, but uh, this, as I said, is tethered to the tip of the cone, and uh, it cannot really move very far. It just, you know, there's some oscillation uh, degrees of freedom that it has, and uh, it uh, remains confined there all the time. So what do you want to do? So this is some particular orbifold, and we want to perform an analytic continuation in this orbifold index n to, uh, you know, make it look like uh, one picture that I had shown earlier, in which one essentially has a uh, replicated manifold, uh, of half space, you know, this, uh, as Subrat was mentioning, this is one half space and this is the other entangled half space. And uh, as we uh, take an analytic continuation, so this is a very different analytic continuation, this involves the temporal coordinate, we find that, you know, this is uh, just uh, our favorite uh, Rindler geometry, uh, which is often a good approximation to the uh, near horizon geometry of uh, non-extremal black holes. So, uh, what we are computing is the entropy associated uh, with this horizon, with the Rindler horizon. Okay. So, in order to do that, uh, we have to calculate uh, the string partition function uh, in uh, the orbifold geometry. And the one loop string partition function, and uh, this one here, uh, stands for the uh, one loop part, which I'm calling uh, Z1N. This corresponds to a toroidal world sheet. But, and in which obviously we, uh, you know, sum over all uh, string degrees of freedom. However, this is not the space time partition function, and that's really worth emphasizing. There are two partition functions here in play. The torus diagram, when we uh, look at it from this point of space-time, you know, at uh, long enough distances, this simply looks like a vacuum bubble. And the space-time partition function, uh, as uh, students from the quantum field theory 2 course will remember, is simply an exponentiation of the vacuum bubble. Therefore, what I was calling this z hat is simply the exponentiation of the Walshit partition function. However, uh, there's an important distinction that I would like you to remember, and which is central to our story, is that for positive odd integral n, this z hat, the space-time partition function, does not correspond to an integral script n. What this integral script n corresponds to is 1 over n, which is uh, some uh, rational number less than one, which is definitely not an integer. But we would like to go to the scenario or the exam in the cases where the script n is an integer. And that information is not available to us from this orbifold point of view. And what we are calling the physical region is uh, the region where this n, the orbifold n, is between zero and one, and uh, we, we would like to make an analytic continuation and study its properties. Uh, here, I must mention a very uh, interesting story uh, that Edward had explored in uh, 2018 in that paper that I had mentioned. Uh, this picture was implemented in a you know, really fascinating manner uh, in the case of open strings attached to D brains, which 
uh, you know, crossed uh, the Rindler horizon. And uh, one loop open string diagram, so let me draw a picture here. So uh, this is uh, the open string, you know, attached between two D brains, uh, and uh, you know, open strings, the ends of open strings are rigidly fixed to the D brains. And it's an open string uh, one loop diagram in this picture. But uh, from another point of view, you know, which is uh, really a beautiful thing about string theory when I was uh, mentioning in the beginning, uh, that uh, by this open closed du uh, duality, this corresponds to a three level closed string exchange uh, between these uh, two uh, D brains. And uh, you know, just by studying the open string partition function, we could uh, learn something about the closed string in the spectrum in the analytic continuation. And uh, it turns out that the open string, uh, it had no tachyon in the spectrum. And uh, there was uh, correspondingly uh, through the UVIR uh, duality between open and closed strings, uh, there was a very nice uh, behavior of the closed strings in the UV. However, for n greater than one, which is you know, for generic orbifolds, uh, there are open string UV divergences which correspond to tachyons in the closed string channel. However, and this is the most interesting thing that Edward found, these tachyons disappear in the physical region after analytic continuation. And in this physical region, uh, as far as uh, the open string partition function uh, could tell us about closed strings, uh, it, the theory uh, made uh, you know very good sense, and uh, uh, there were uh, no uh, divergences of this kind. And there are some other uh, very uh, nice aspects which I will not mention here. In fact, uh, you know it was uh, mainly this result uh, which uh, you know uh, made us hope that. Uh, something could be done, uh, uh, you know, along, uh, the li along these lines you know, for the closed string, and we could hope that uh, in the physical region, uh, we could po uh, possibly say something useful uh, when we considered closed strings. However, uh, this uh, again, I will not uh, go into uh, all these details and uh, you know uh, many sort of uh, difficulties that we faced. Uh, this problem did uh, appear to be forbiddingly difficult at first. But uh, let me not bore you with that story, and let's uh, jump straight ahead. Uh, any questions or comments at this point? Please. Yeah. Yeah, tree-level contribution, uh, that gives rise to the uh, bekenstein hawking term of the area. It was uh, done by a paper of Atisha's uh, from 2002 on uh, this uh, tachyon condensation. Yeah, no, I mean, it, the tachyon condensation doesn't uh, matter uh, really at uh, this point. I mean, the paper is titled tachyon condensation, but it's uh, uh, not central to our story at this point. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, in, uh, with, uh, because, uh, you know, he had enough supersymmetries, uh, the G that appeared uh, was completely unrenormalized, a tree level uh, coupling, a tree level Newton constant. So uh, this is the closed string partition function, the one loop or before partition function. And okay, this is a complicated formula, but we'll uh, get somewhere. So this is the uh, area, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. And uh, these are uh, you know, various functions which you can just read. Here, uh, this quantity tau is the torus modular parameter. And uh, the integral region is the fundamental domain of the uh, SL2Z group, and this, uh, in this integral, uh, there appears uh, uh, Jacobi theta function and the Dedekind eta function, and only yesterday we heard that, you know, it was really 19th century mathematicians uh, uh, whose work, you know, we have been using in uh, string theory all the time, and here are two shining examples of uh, these functions, one named after Jacobi, one named after Dedekind, uh, whose functions, uh, you know, they continue to be useful to us uh, deep in the 21st century. 
But as I understand very well that uh, this slide is very unilluminating because this is just a bunch of symbols with no meaning. So let me unpack this formula a little bit. This AH is the regularized horizon area of the transverse directions. So we essentially have R2, which is the orbifold plane, times R8, which is the remaining transverse eight directions. And this AH is the volume of these directions, which is suitably uh, you know, regularized in string units. And uh, let me say a few words about the spectrum. It's uh, best to analyze uh, this story in the green Schwartz formalism in the light cone gauge. And in each sector, there's one twisted complex boson which corresponds uh, to you know, twists on the orbifold plane. And this one twisted complex boson, as we'll remember, this curves, uh, goes to the denominator and this gives rise to a denominator, uh, this theta function in the denominator. There are also three untwisted complex bosons, you know, which are left unaffected by this orbifold and they contribute to this eta to the six here. And because we are starting with uh, type two supersymmetric theory, uh, there are super partners of the bosons, which are fermions and uh, this, uh, all the four fermions are charged under uh, you know, rotation on the orbifold plane. And correspondingly, these fermions go to the numerator. Uh, and here, uh, this, there are two integers, k and l, you know, each of them range over n values. And they label the different twisted sectors of the orbifold and else correspond to the twines. If this word is unfamiliar to you, uh, don't worry, I'll exp also explain it in the next slide. Uh, so uh, it's uh, actually most intuitive uh, to, you know, also study it in the uh, Hamiltonian picture. In th this integrand, this can be written as a trace, as a particular trace involving Q and Q bar where Q is our uh, favorite, uh, you know, uh, function of the modular parameter uh, e to the two pi i tau. So what does this say? This says that this function g mod square is nothing but the trace over the twisted Hilbert space. So there are, uh, in the orbifold, there are, uh, you know, k different Hilbert, uh, in different Hilbert spaces. And this particular term in the sum is uh, this trace over this Hilbert space. And because it's an orbifold, uh, on orbifold we also have to uh, act on with this rotation operator. And this g to the l is uh, nothing but this generator of the orbifold group. And over here, obviously, it's, uh, st you know, string theory, we have some oscillator vacuum and uh, we act on this oscillator vacuum uh, with uh, raising operators. So nl and nr are the oscillator energies and epsilon LR, LR are the vacuum uh, or the uh, oscillator vacuum uh, or uh, the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. The sum one over N, you know, and this L sum, this affects projection operation. You know, again, uh, in, this is uh, another beauty of string theory that, you know, even in orbifolds only uh, this Zn invariant states will contribute and uh, there are many states which you would have naively thought would be present, get projected out by this operation. And there's a tau one integral, uh, which forces a constraint named after the second director of this institute, uh, which simply says that NL equals LR, NR, uh, and uh, physically this simply means uh, that uh, no point on the closed string is more special than the other. Uh, so we also want a space-time interpretation of this picture. So in the space-time, if uh, the particle has mass m, the mass squared of the particle, 
is given simply by uh, the uh, sum of this, you know, the ground state energy plus the excitation energies. And here, however, is a trouble because there are states where m square is negative, namely, uh, there are tachyonic states in the spectrum. Again, uh, we are led to uh, you know, the beauty of uh, string theory. We have to do this integral over the fundamental domain, which is defined like this. And uh, we uh, split this you know, integral in a nice form in which the way Peterson measure appears in the integrand and this f is whatever was left behind from that. And this really is sort of uh, one of the most beautiful things uh, one can imagine in string theory which uh, you know, connects mathematics and physics in a very deep manner, namely the fundamental domain. As Edward had explained to us yesterday, String theory naturally provides a cutoff, and this integral uh, doesn't extend over uh, this entire upper half plane, but this uh, uh, an overcounting which we must not do, and that in fact is uh, obtained just by cutting this off. So string theory naturally takes care of a could have been UV divergence which appears beneath this section. However, uh, you know, from our childhood, we are uh, taught to be uh, very scared of UV divergences for good reasons. Uh, in, uh, as we grow up, of course, we realize that uh, UV divergences uh, we can uh, deal with uh, you know, more easily. They are a sort of uh, more innocuous in certain sense. What is uh, not so nice is IR divergences, which appears from uh, the uh, far end, you know, the uh, tau 2 going to, so this is the uh, tau plane, and this tau 1 is the real direction, tau 2 is the imaginary direction. Uh, from very large values of tau 2, we could get infrared divergences uh, that uh, should make us worried. So, I mean, again, infrared divergences, uh, we probably also shouldn't be scared of. It simply means that uh, we are, doing something wrong or asking a wrong question. I mean, for example, we are probably uh, doing perturbation theory about some unstable vacuum. So the worrisome uh, thing in our picture is that there are severe infrared divergences. And this infrared divergences, this severe infrared divergences arise from tachyons. And uh, of these tachyons, there are many. So first, I'll discuss the leading tachyons. Uh, the untwisted sector uh, is uh, given by the k equal to zero term of the orbifold sum, and that is tachyon free as uh, we would expect. And each of these remaining sectors has a leading tachyon. So uh, let's just analyze it you know, from a simple uh, oscillator calculation uh, and uh, just confine our attention to you know, something, uh, this uh, values of k, which is less than n minus 1 over 2. Remember, n is an odd integer, so n minus 1 over 2 uh, is an integer. So uh, there are three complex untwisted bosons with the ground state energy of minus 1 twelfth. So for the younger members in the audience, uh, let me tell you that this minus 1 twelfth is actually uh, the sum of all positive integers and uh, this is also related to the fact that uh, the bosonic string uh, lives in uh, uh, 26 dimensions. And uh, also related to superstring living in 10 dimensions. This one, comp so uh, when uh, the fields are twisted, obviously, uh, uh, there's a shift of the ground state energy uh, commensurate with the twist. So we get some additional terms, 1 minus 2k over n times k over n. Then there are four complex twisted fermions, and for the fermions, obviously, uh, the ground state energy is positive, and uh, this is actually half twisted because the fermions are half twisted uh, as compared to bosons. So when we add them up, we get minus k over n, the constant negative term disappears, 
the quadratic term disappears, leaving us with only a negative term. And there's a factor of two which comes from the two sectors. So in total, in every sector, there's a leading tachyon of energy minus 2k over n. And indeed, this is also what we find uh, from uh, an analysis of uh, the Jacobi theta function and the Dedekind eta function that uh, when we uh, you know, do an asymptotic expansion, it's uh, slightly involved, uh, not too involved, uh, uh, fairly straightforward, but one has to be careful. Uh, we find that this gives precisely this structure uh, when uh, you know k is uh, below half into uh, half of n roughly, and when k is uh, k is above uh, half of n, uh, we get this. And in fact, this is a very nice feature. We find that uh, in the tachyon spectrum, it's nicely symmetric about the midpoint. Namely, uh, there's a k uh, going to n minus k symmetry in the spectrum. So from now on, I will you know, stop discussing the second line uh, when k lies on this upper part and look at only this part uh, when k ranges between 1 and n minus 1 over 2 and just, you know, uh, multiply it by 2 to get the answer we need. Any questions at this point? However, so if you thought the tachyons were bad story, let, us, let me add to the uh, uh, bad news uh, even further. Uh, there are subleading tachyons. I mean, even if we have the tachyons, we can uh, you know, add uh, uh, more and more oscillators on it. And uh, the spectrum obviously uh, you know, goes from negative and it, it will uh, keep rising. But there's uh, no guarantee that you know it will. Uh, the leading tachyon is all you will get, and there can be subleading tachyons. Quite remarkably, though, in every twisted K sector, uh, there's a very nice structure of the subleading tachyons. And uh, from an analysis of the theta and eta functions, we find this. So. This is what we had uh, seen in this previous slide. But now we have to understand the corrections to this formula. This is the leading exponential divergence. And then there are subleading exponential divergences, which I can write as 1 plus something something. And this something something is just this. It's, and we see that it follows a very nice structure. Uh, it's a nice exponential uh, series. Uh, you know, with uh, regularly spaced, uh, uh, you know, excitation energies. And uh, it appears, uh, every, every uh, each one of this appears with uh, degeneracy 1. And uh, this is actually uh, one of the series uh, that's been known to uh, humans for the longest time. It's a finite geometric series about whose importance we'll uh, say more later. Okay, I'll, yes, thank you. So here, Rk is the largest non-negative integer such that this condition is satisfied. Roughly, this corresponds to uh, the number of oscillators by which you have to act on this tachyonic vacuum uh, before you reach something massless or massive. So Rk, by design, in, uh, you know, includes only the tachyonic terms in each k sector. If you have Rk plus, so in this uh, sector, you know, if you multiply this with that, and if you have Rk plus 1, that Rk plus 1 state will either be a massless state or a massive string state. Okay. And uh, it's uh, also interesting, uh, as I said, uh, this all subleading tachyons appear with unit degeneracy. And uh, furthermore, uh, although it's not obvious from this formula, that if you simply remove this d tau 1 integral, this does not change. Namely, uh, the Zn invariance, which comes from the L sum, and level matching, which comes from this dt, d tau 1 integral, one seems to imply the other, which was very surprising to us in the uh, beginning when uh, we saw this. So in order to substantiate what we saw from an anal analysis of the theta functions and eta functions, 
uh, we could, we had to find a way to justify it using an oscillator calculation using operators. So, uh, this is the twisted boson oscillator expansions. And, uh, you know, no, there's no zero mode here uh, because it's twisted. And that's the nice part of the story. That's the reason it's really localized at the tip of the cone. And then uh, these alphas are the oscillators in the uh, right moving sector, and alpha tilde is the oscillator in the left moving sector. And then uh, there are the uh, oscillators, which are complex conjugates of this oscillator X. And uh, obviously, there are also untwisted boson oscillators and fermionic oscillators, uh, by acting with which uh, we can obtain uh, higher string modes, uh, you know, uh, tachyonic, massless, or massive states. So these subleading tachyons, which really are excited states on top of this harmonic oscillator vacuum, this can be created only, it turns out, uh, you can try to find it, but you wouldn't be able to, that this subleading tachyons in which the energy still remains negative, they can be created only by the powers of alpha and alpha bar tilde of you know, this quantity, of this specific oscillator mode. And notice that alpha and alpha bar appear together, namely the complex and the complex conjugate quantities appear together, which implies Zn invariance. And there's also alpha and alpha tilde. Alpha is the left moving sector, alpha tilde is the right moving sector, and we have an equal number of oscillators. So this is a way to see that uh, uh, Zn invariance and level matching actually go hand in hand as far as the tachyon is considered. This is obviously not true for uh, higher string modes or massless or massive modes. And uh, as we saw uh, from the uh, slide before, the excitation energy, you know, uh, as also can be seen from this picture, uh, are just uh, twice of this number. And you know, if it's just one oscillator that you know, uh, and one uh, vacuum, all these states of tachyons they manifestly have unit degeneracy. So, which nicely explains the observations that we made earlier. And just in case you are wondering, uh, the fermions and the untwisted bosonic oscillators do not make uh, any contribution uh, to the tachyonic spectrum, but they do make contributions uh, to the uh, massless and massive spectra. So here's a pictorial representation for you know a large enough integer uh, n equals 13. So remember uh, I told you that we'll be only considering uh, states between n equals uh, k equals 1 and n minus 1 over 2 which is 1 over 6 and the full spectrum obviously you know you can just reflect it about a horizontal axis. So uh, it turns out that uh, most of these subleading tachyons uh, in number, they are sharply peaked around the halfway point. For k equals 6, uh, there are five subleading tachyons. And uh, as we uh, you know, go down just one number, there's just one subleading tachyon. And uh, for uh, this below, uh, there are no subleading tachyons at all. But you know, as we increase n, you know, we can take n to be 57 or 73. It will always be sharply picked, but uh, more and more uh, tachyons would permeate into uh, lower values of k. So what do we want to do? We want to calculate the contribution of all these tachyons. So in order to do that, uh, let us do a very crude approximation at first. We do something called a leading tachyonic sum, in which uh, uh, we uh, take a sum over uh, these uh, R values at every K, and uh, essentially we'll approximate them by one for a reason you will see why, and then just take a sum of these leading tachyons. So, uh, just so that I don't have to go to a previous slide again, here's the tachyonic contribution to the integrand. This factor of two comes because of the symmetry in the spectrum. This is the leading tachyon and this is the subleading tachyonic contribution. And if 
k i have already told you is a finite geometric series which uh, we learned in how uh, in high school how to sum a finite geometric series for this finite geometric series it's simply this quantity and here uh, notice something uh, interesting that it's 1 minus exponential of some negative quantity always and the denominator is also uh, 1 minus exponential of some negative quantity. So as uh, we go to the uh, infrared region, namely we take uh, tau 2 to infinity, we will simply approximate this fk by 1. And therefore, we simply neglect this and sum this series. But again, this is another geometric series with unit coefficients. And this is where we land. And here, esteemed members of the audience, is one of the most important features of this sum. That once we have summed it, on this right hand side, we have uh, uh, lost any information about whether n is an integer or not. This here is an analytic formula in n. And what is more, as we go to the physical region, 0 less than n less than 1, we find that this exponent actually is negative in the physical region. And the exponent below was already uh, negative in the first place. So again, we, in this physical region, after analytic continuation, we obtain something 1 minus e to the minus a positive quantity over 1 minus e to the uh, exponential another positive uh, negative uh, quantity. Therefore, as we take the limit tau to going to infinity, we, this gives a finite answer for large tau 2. This tells us that as we sum the leading tachyon, uh, we uh, actually uh, seem to be getting closer to the kind of answer that we want, namely finite behavior uh, in the region n less than 1. However, I have not really solved anything yet because we have not yet dealt with all the tachyonic divergences, namely in approximating that quantity fk by 1, uh, we have simply forgotten about the subleading tachyons, but this, although they are subleading tachyons, they are still tachyons. And an integral over the moduli space uh, for n greater than 1 would still give divergent answers. So what do we do? So we do something uh, uh, that we need to do, namely we need to uh, add all these subleading tachyons into the story. So let us remember that in the subleading tachyonic sum, this fk uh, uh, has this property where uh, this uh, integer uh, r runs from 0 to rk. And here's what uh, is sort of the unappealing part of the picture. This appearance of this integer rk, which is, a, you know, which is an obstruction to doing some nice sum. Therefore, what do we do? And obviously, uh, uh, as, uh, it have, as it might have been obvious to you, this uh, presence of rk does not help with the analytic continuation. So the simplest possibility, uh, like any pragmatic physicist, is to take rk to infinity. And what does this mean? This means that in uh, this subleading tachyonic sum, we are actually adding an infinite number of states, some of which are massless, and almost, almost all of which are massive. And this is an infinite tower of massive states. And these are all fictitious. So let us see uh, in pictorial terms what this means. So these are the fictitious states. These are the leading tachyons. These are the uh, subleading tachyons that are physically present in for n equals 7. And now, uh, in order to do the calculation, we simply add a host of fictitious states here, uh, which can be uh, massless or massive, and we just populate this whole lattice. 
in the RK plane. And now, uh, I spoke about doing a certain sum one way. Now, this is really the modified sum. We take k from 1 to n minus 2, and r goes from 0 to infinity. And this modified sum, I'm uh, calling by the name f tilde t. Uh, this t here stands for tachyon. And yet, uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, th th there can be some states that actually exist, but uh, we will eventually add and subtract uh, this. Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, uh, that's immaterial. So these st states could exist. So uh, from the point of view of uh, what I was doing so far, namely just looking at the tachyons, these are fictitious, but e indeed. Uh, I mean, what it will end up doing is it might change the degeneracy of some states later. Indeed, thank you for that question. So now in this anti-continuation, uh, we will just do uh, for each values of R, the whole K sum. The K sum, uh, it uh, turns out, is still a finite geometric sum. And uh, we, uh, this, uh, there's an infinite R sum, which uh, we will, of course, retain. And quite amazingly, this sum still has the same structure. It's a geometric sum, and for each values of R, we, in, uh, the sum has an R-dependent factor, which appears naturally. And the sum still has this factor of n minus 1 upstairs. So when n is greater than 1, of course, this is badly divergent as we uh, take tau to, to infinity. But when n uh, becomes less than 1, uh, this quantity uh, goes to 0 at last tau 2, as does this. And this is a very uh, nice convergence series. And we end up with precisely a finite answer in the physical region 0 less than n less than or equal to 1. And in fact, uh, quite pleasingly, uh, this answer, if you put uh, n equals 1 here, this is 1 minus 1, uh, which is 0. And uh, that's quite pleasing because we know that the answer n equals 1, the uh, z1 or before is trivial. That's just the 10 dimensional superstring partition function which vanishes on account of space time supersymmetry. So, this is nicely consi uh, consistent with uh, that picture as well. And uh, therefore, we find that uh, although in this unphysical domain the tachyons have a menacing appearance, uh, they are not actually physically threatening in uh, this actual domain. And uh, there are several features uh, which go behind this result. And these are just the features that uh, superstring theory uh, happened to be born with. So what are these features? First, there are exactly n minus 1 leading tachyons with unit degeneracy in each twisted sector. This is an important fact for the nice behavior in the physical regime. 0 less than n less than or equal to 1, the structure would be lost otherwise. If we had n plus 1 leading tachyons, we wouldn't have this. We would have some different analytic property of this function. The leading tachyon mass squared spectrum is also linear in k, and which really is uh, the reason that we could uh, do this geometric sum nicely. And this arises from uh, some non-trivial cancellations because of uh, the supersymmetry of the parent uh, type 2 string theory. Uh, this is a non-trivial feature. This does not happen, for example, in the bosonic string orbifold, uh, where the mass squared spectrum is quadratic in K, and uh, uh, we don't know, at least I, I don't know how to uh, do that sum in a nice way. And uh, remarkably, the degeneracy of the subleading tachyons in each sector is also unity, and even there, the mass squared spectrum is linear in K. So it seems that uh, the amazing features of super string theory, uh, super string theory are conspiring to uh, give us uh, a very nice result. Uh, so what have we done here? This is the f tilde t function that we had seen a few slides ago. 
and this f tilde r is a remainder uh, which, you know, this is nothing, this just says that uh, from the actual function we have subtracted of something. But quite remarkably, because this uh, second sum that I described, that takes into account the effects of all subleading tachyons. And therefore, this f tilde r, that's manifestly tachyon free, even in the unphysical region. Otherwise, this full modular integral is quite divergent. So it, we have split the integral into two parts. Now, this part of the integral is obviously divergent. This is the tachyonic part. But this, uh, as I have argued, and I'll show you more evidence, this does not diverge in the physical domain, which is uh, the, uh, region zero, uh, the region between 0 and 1. And uh, so uh, in order to uh, say more about uh, this, uh, we would have to uh, deal with this whole function. And how do we deal with that? So here's something, uh, you know, perhaps one of the most pedestrian approaches that one can take, that uh, this integral involving f tilde r, the remainder integral, uh, we uh, would presumably uh, find a smooth function in this region by some numerical interpolation method. So we, you know, after having uh, subtracted of this integral, this integral uh, is uh, just uh, one number, uh, th that function is just one number we'll get uh, as uh, a function of n. And for n equals no, we know that uh, its value is zero. For n equals three, five, seven, uh, we would presumably be able to fit uh, some uh, nice function so that we are able to determine its behavior in this region. And uh, we could try to uh, add more and more points and check for its numerical stability of a smooth curve in this region, which would tell us about the full function in this region, because we already know that the second part of the function is finite. And presumably, uh, something like uh, Newton's uh, method, you know, which is uh, one of the oldest known interpolation formula, uh, that might be able to help us because uh, all these points are actually equispaced uh, as it must happen in uh, the Newton series. If we add these two integrals uh, in the physical domain, we would then get a finite answer. So here is the uh, tachyonic integral in the physical region, which is the second integral, and uh, this is, uh, you know, just evaluated numerically. So this first part, you know, it's a crude approximation in which instead of the fundamental domain, really this rectangle is taken, uh, leaving out this part. And this gives a very uh, nice result, you know, which uh, saturates uh, near zero and uh, actually approaches zero as n goes to one. And uh, doing this uh, integral over the fundamental domain uh, is uh, also straightforward, but you know, it takes a bit more uh, computation, uh, computational time. And we see more or less the same structure here uh, as in uh, you know, doing the very crude version with this uh, truncated fundamental domain. So which shows that uh, this modular integral uh, in the fundamental domain in the physical region is actually a finite number uh, for tachyon and uh, it can be calculated. So uh, that is that. So uh, there's an analogy that uh, I would, uh, we, we made in the paper that I, I would also like to emphasize here. So one of the classics, uh, uh, classic analogs is uh, finding an analytic extension of the factorial which is defined only for uh, non-negative integers. And this classic problem was uh, addressed by Euler, uh, among others. And the function with uh, the right properties is nothing but Euler's gamma function. So here we see the values of the factorial at uh, these integer values. And you know, having known it, uh, known these values, uh, we can analytically extend it uh, <coughs> on the 
uh, entire complex plane, and this you know just show, obviously is showing the uh, real axis. And the right properties of, is obviously uh, gamma n plus one, which is uh, the factorial function for non-negative integers. Our situation here is, uh, of course, uh, the opposite. We know for a fact that uh, for uh, <coughs> certain integers, our function diverges, like uh, or the gamma function diverges at uh, non-positive values of its argument. And uh, we want to find something uh, that's uh, nicely smooth and analytic on uh, other values on the other half plane. So this is an analogy that's uh, probably uh, worth bearing in mind as uh, we set about uh, exploring this in more detail. So uh, obviously this is uh, not the end of the story. On quite the contrary, this is just a beginning. There are several ways uh, we can uh, go ahead uh, and uh, deal with this problem. Some of the immediate questions uh, that we can address are as follows. So uh, I spoke about some special, uh, you know, conspiratorial behavior of the superstring. So please. Hmm. Yes. Yes. No, no, in the end going to one limit, uh, so the quantity was going to zero, but uh, not necessarily, so this is not the full answer, this is just part of the answer. The full answer we don't yet know, uh, the, uh, no. we have to do the uh, rem uh, remainder part and obtain something smooth, but this is the tachyonic part, which is going to zero uh, indeed, but uh, as we can see from the graph, its derivative is not going to zero, uh, uh, near n equals one. And, and precisely at n equals one, it's exactly zero, but even if we add you know, n equals one plus uh, 10 to the minus 50, that would be badly divergent because uh, you know, this is really a tachyonic integral. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, this full answer, so this is uh, not even uh, the full answer of what we set about to explore. This is part of the answer, you know, which I, we believe is quite important. But obviously, uh, uh, we, uh, the full answer for entanglement entropy uh, would be you know, some uh, g-string expansion. And you know, this is obviously the genus one term. And there would uh, obviously be other contributions so which can uh, obtain, uh, which, which can be obtained as uh, a higher genus contributions to the partition function, uh, you know, from, you know, genus two demand surfaces and so on. So, but it's obvious at least that in, for this answer at one loop, I'm sorry, is maybe yeah, please, please. an obvious question, uh, that the cutoff is somehow set by L string rather than L blank, that the, whatever term you get looks like area over L string, is yes, that correct? Yes, yes, That is obvious that it, this happens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, why is it obvious? I no, I mean, it's it's, this uh, comes from the calculation, right? Uh, I mean, uh, okay. I'm sure it's obvious to you, but okay, you, right, can, right, you right, could okay. explain so, why it's uh, not obvious to me. One yeah, right. uh, particular case. Uh, huh? so, oh, there, no, this, there's no g-string, so you can only get area over, but is no, it no, clear no. that you so get area this, over l-string? There's an expansion area over g, yes. and uh, let's uh, talk about four dimensions, so area over 4g. And 4G uh, would be area over L string squared, G squared. Very good. So this is the classical tree level term in the action. What we are calculating is the leading calculation. Let's call this A1 G squared plus Dot, dot, dot. We are, this is in the limit of large area, you know, where other terms are suppressed, you know, log A and one over area. So let's just look at this term. So this is what we are calculating. So it's area over four L string square where the dependence on G string has uh, disappeared. I see, I see. And, and the fact that you get the area term, that's also just obvious somehow in this. Yeah, yeah, it, it, just, it just emerges. Uh, <coughs> 
it's not yeah so i could is it possible to quickly explain why you get the uh, maybe it's completely it's obvious no. i see yeah. i mean essentially because of delta zero which you know is uh, the volume of space time and here we don't get the complete volume of the space time because of uh, the orbifold uh, Is it okay? Yes, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's just one term in the expansion that we are computing. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, it's eggs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so alpha prime is L string squared. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to know. Yeah, I mean, as physicists, we care about the number, so we have to. I mean, just to show that it was, I mean, it was not obvious that it uh, would be a finite number, and you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, to uh, begin with, you know, it's obviously uh, ten-dimensional tight two-string theory with you know maximal. I mean, okay, or before it breaks it, but if you uh, uh, look at it from the point of view of replica trick. It just, you know, is a sort of replicated manifold uh, of uh, type two string theory in which uh, there's no uh, renormalization of the Newton constant. C can I just ask one more Please. obvious question? The obvious question is, uh, is it surprising that the tree level answer gave you A over four G Newton in perturbative string theory? I mean, one might have thought that somehow that requires degrees of freedom that go beyond perturbative string theory. Is it? I, 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 but it somehow happens that you you get a finite A over 4G Newton, finite, so everything is finite, uh, some in perturbative string theory somehow works out. Okay, okay, so <laughs> let, let me just. Uh, just one more. Yeah, please, please, please. Uh, this is a very. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, could, could you just rephrase it slightly? I didn't, I didn't follow the yeah, yeah, sure. Something to make sense. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, no, no. So indeed, we do. No, no. Just to emphasize this point, please. Yeah. 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 Not yet. <laughs> yes. So that's this part. 
that's the remainder. And this is the divergent part for integer n. And thank you, uh, Edward, for uh, this answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Yes, Marco. Please. Yes. So that's a great question. So there's this, uh, which is a sector k equals 0, l equals 0, which uh, goes like volume. And that uh, is 0 uh, because of the fermion 0 modes, or in other words, space-time supersymmetry. So uh, one obvious question is, uh, you know, this is type 2B string theory uh, in which, you know, there are many conspiracies. So how generic are the features that we have studied? And how can we generalize it to other important contexts, including, uh, you know, possible string compactifications? Would it still hold? Uh, we don't know. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, what we would uh, like to do is, uh, you know, garner, uh, you know, make a more mathematically rigorous treatment of this whole integral. Uh, are we able to rule out some pathological possibilities? Because, okay, you might ask that uh, the uh, uh, tachyons analytically continued, uh, you know, gave a nice answer, but uh, can, uh, can we rule out the possibility that uh, the uh, uh, massless and massive states won't be, a, uh, you know, behave like tachyons in, the, in less than one region? We don't know yet. That's a possibility. We think it's physically unlikely that, you know, uh, at least from the point of view of effective field theory, that uh, massive and massless uh, states uh, would, uh, you know, do something so strange. But uh, we are in the process of examining this, uh, you know, more uh, from a more mathematical point of view, and uh, hope to report it on soon. And obviously, we want to garner uh, more numerical data of this whole modular integral, and you know, this is uh, some. Uh, you know, really precise numerics that we have to do, you know, sometimes probably uh, with a numerical precision of 1,000 or 2,000 digits, uh, which uh, would be important. And uh, we are working on some of these questions already, and uh, uh, you will get to know more about it, uh, hopefully, in the near future. Please. Yeah, no, no I'm uh, nearly at the end. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Oh uh, well. Uh, we hope that we don't yet know if uh, that's true, but indeed we hope uh, that something like Carlson's theorem uh, would be useful in this case. You know, that's why I also mentioned Newton series uh, because. Carlson theorem has often been used to justify, you know, the uniqueness of uh, the Newton series expansion. So that's the hope, uh, and we uh, are, have been thinking about it, you know, even before uh, we put it out. Uh, we have uh, had a lot of brainstorming over uh, these ideas. So uh, this is uh, almost my last slide, and uh, I thought. Uh, it might not be so uh, inappropriate. I apologize in advance, but uh, I'll put forward you know, some uh, of the implications of our results and maybe some uh, vague speculations. And I apologize for uh, you know, this, having this vague slide. So uh, perhaps uh, the most important question pertaining uh, uh, you know, is the black hole information paradox. And quantum entanglement, or uh, more specifically, it's, you know, some Theorems related to quantum entanglement, uh, namely the uh, strong subadditivity theorem, is the key player in uh, Mathur's formulation of the information paradox, uh, which was also subsequently used by uh, Almeri, Marolf, Polchinski, and Sully. Uh, so that's something that we might like to address. And uh, we could learn something about black hole entropy in string theory, perhaps, uh, by this question, because 
the geometry that we have considered, uh, it approximates the near horizon region of non-extremal black holes really well, and uh, also in the context of ADS CFT, that uh, would be an important question to address. Uh, the orbifold uh, breaks the supersymmetries. Uh, is there any hope that uh, we can study uh, non-supersymmetric black holes with this method? Because uh, the black holes in the real world are obviously uh, not supersymmetric, and some of the most rigorous studies of uh, black holes in string theory actually uh, come from supersymmetric contexts. And uh, in this uh, sense, it might also be useful to uh, look at an off-shell formulation, which is obviously much uh, less developed than uh, you know, on-shell string theory. So as this technology gets more and more developed, it might be worthwhile to use it to understand uh, some of these uh, you know, uh, non-classical uh, geometries. And finally, uh, as a hope, as uh, we were uh, discussing also with Edward uh, the day uh, he came here in 3S day, uh, some of uh, the most well-defined quantum field theories are obviously defined on the lattice. And on the lattice, uh, we typically have uh, some sort of a, a type 1 von Neumann algebra. Uh, and string theory uh, does something uh, very close to what a lattice does. Namely, it gives us a natural ultraviolet cutoff. So uh, would it be too much to hope for uh, that there can also be uh, some type 1 uh, von Neumann algebra in string theory? Obviously, at this point, uh, we don't know because we don't even know how to define an algebra in string theory. Uh, but uh, that is that. And uh, for the last part, uh, I would actually like to uh, make a golden jubilee tribute. So this, uh, this year, uh, we had a golden jubilee of uh, QCD, quantum chromodynamics, uh, one of the most successful theories in uh, recent memory. And we had a very nice colloquium by uh, you know one of uh, uh, the people who uh, you know discovered qcd in a certain sense and uh, we had a very interesting colloquium but in the same year around the same time uh, there was another paper uh, that came out which happens to be directly responsible for this huddle that we are organizing and we are still uh, trying to uh, you know, grapple with its implications. Uh, okay, uh, I must uh, say that uh, this I didn't remember at first, but uh, you know, uh, during a, a family video call yesterday, my mother pointed it out to me. So it's this paper, which was uh, published almost exactly 50 years back. And I uh, urge you to read the abstract. And it's uh, really full of fascinating ideas, if you, even if you Look at the abstract, you would realize that, you know, that this is really what we are talking about. Uh, at uh, the time uh, that this paper was published, obviously the author probably didn't anticipate that, you know, his ideas uh, would uh, be verified uh, you know, sooner or later. You know, af after the publication of this paper, it took two years before uh, Hawking supplied uh, the factor uh, one quarter. and. Uh, Actually, uh, 23 years uh, before uh, Strominger and Wafa uh, gave, uh, you know, substantiated that uh, this is truly statistical entropy. Um, coming back to our paper, uh, obviously, uh, we are very excited about w our work. Uh, uh, we don't know, or at least I definitely don't know what impact it will have or whether it will have any impact at all. Uh, that's really for. Uh, Posterity to decide, uh, but uh, okay, I can't really wait, uh, you know, that long. And because, <laughs> uh, and uh, in in a sense, I'm much more fortunate because I don't have to wait for posterity. I am privileged enough to uh, have this uh, distinguished audience before me. We will uh, probably uh, give uh, me more uh, insightful comments that we can build on. Thank you very much. Uh, so, what? Please. One, one quick question. Yes. I don't think this question is very physically important, but wouldn't there be a, an infrared divergence from massless 
states? Great question. Actually, no. There were, could have been an inferred divergence from master states, but let me go back and show you the formula. Uh, because of the zero modes, uh, you know, the momentum zero modes, there are always sufficient powers of tau 2 in the denominator. So, okay, even if you look at, just look at the uh, way Peterson measured, this is 1 over tau 2 square. And in, inside that f, there's a 1 over tau 2 cube. Uh, well, I, I just meant, I mean, in the space time. Yes. There, the massless modes in the space-time, you're talking about the entanglement entropy in Rindler, right? I'm sorry, in, in... In Rindler, right? Yes, yes. Wouldn't you expect of some long-distance logarithmic divergent uh, contribution uh, to the yeah, entanglement yeah, yeah. So, entropy? Uh, so how do you end up with no, a no, finite no, no, answer? That, that, that's a great question. That, so, I think that's a d different than the massless state. No, here. no, no, no. Uh, that's indeed a great question. And uh, uh, this, you know, simply uh, is... Uh, in, a, in an expand, you know, such uh, sort of terms are responsible, for example, you know, uh, logarithmic terms in uh, the corrections to the right. Bekenstein Hawking formula. But we are working in the limit of large A, in which uh, we have, you know, uh, sufficiently large so that uh, that term is neglected, and this is the leading term in that expansion. But yes. Uh, I, okay. E, of course, that term is infinity, right? So it's bigger than A for all A. But I, I understand. Yeah, I mean, A is much uh, bigger than, no. so. Right, sure, but the term is log A divided by zero, right? Divided, by yeah. Log a, a in what, log of A in what units? No, but that. No, I meaning I think a priori this has nothing to do with black hole entropy. I mean, also the fact that you get area upon 4G from a tree level calculation, it's quite similar to uh, Gibbons and Hawking in spirit, but I think it's conceptually quite different. I mean, the way you can argue about it. So, first of all, you know that uh, space time partition function is a logarithm of the uh, world sheet partition, sorry, logarithm of the space time partition function. But of course, at tree level, partition function vanishes. So what happens to the uh, space-time partition function? But I think this equivalence ignores boundary terms. So if you include the given Hawking boundary term, uh, you can argue, uh, so there has, it has to be there. And then you can argue that the bulk action has to be zero as long as the Dilaton equations of motion are satisfied because it's the exact conformal field theory. And therefore, you only receive the boundary contribution, and that has a, a nice analytic contribution in n automatically. It's like one of n minus one or something like that. And if you differentiate it, you get area up on 4G naught. So it's actually, I would say it's a bit surprising because there is no black hole. It just yeah. supplied to you by gravity, the string theory. Yeah, e to the minus 2 phi r uh, has to be zero because otherwise there would be dilaton tadpole. But there has to be a Gibbons Hawking term which is k divided by 8 pi g, and that contributes. No, no, so it's a space time uh, calculation. It would be nice if there is a world sheet method of doing it, but, but I think one can argue that effective action has to have that term. Yeah, there is no, at present, no world sheet methods of computing. It's even for a Schwarzschild black hole, you can ask, how do you compute the Be uh, Gibbons Hawking term from a world sheet calculation? Um, and the, at the moment, we don't know, but we don't doubt that that term exists. Please. Just in terms of type one versus other type algebras, if you take the zero brain theory, but maybe more generally, I want to ask it in the context of holography, but if you just take the zero brain theory as the boundary theory for the supergravity dual to it, that theory clearly defines a type one algebra, isn't it? Because it's just quantum mechanics, and at finite n, there's no scope for any divergences. And so isn't that an example where the uh, non-perturbative definition of a theory of gravity gives a type 1 algebra? Uh, 
and one could do higher dimensional analogs, but then you get field theories, and I'm not sure whether that creates a some issue. But here is a clear, isn't there a clear example here in matrix theory or zero brain theory that gives a type one algebra? This is tied to my talk, but some people <laughs> won't be there, so I just want to ask. Well, I, I think the answer is yes, but in those descriptions, we don't know why the, what space-time locality means and so on. That's true. Okay. But uh, I can also add that if you take a two-sided black hole uh, whose near horizon looks like Rindler, then we do know that there is a type one algebra because it's a direct product of left conformal field theory and right conformal field theory, where there is an irreducible representation of the algebra of the right. So that also is a motivation why you expect a well-defined answer in the bulk corresponding to this uh, thermophile double state. Okay. Thank you. More questions or comments to Bo? Okay, if not, let's thank Kuba again.